I've always relished. I, I love pressure. And I, th- I think I, mm. I'm based under pressure. The greater the pressure is, uh, for me, that, that's, that's what pushes, pushes me. And, and I think there's a, a distinction between stress and pressure. I am one of those people, I, I don't like the SWAT. Because it starts, you try to find a solution within the very problem that you're starting. You look for the strengths and the weaknesses, which are the internal parts. And then the opportunities and the threat is a way for me to retreat. I like the notion shift model of the ERRC grid, where I start by thinking of creating. Because whenever you're forced to create something and eliminate something, it brings in a dimension of shift. There is absolutely no currency you can substitute for time. Mm-hmm. Name a currency as valuable as time. And sometimes we try to use other means of other currency for um to substitute time there is no currency you can use to substitute time no this is important there is time and there is quality time mm-hmm. distinguish between the two from very early mm-hmm. hi and welcome again to the unlearn show with jamie and fritz today we have a special guest um a, a dear friend of ours um, who will be joining us. His name is Dr. Marcus Lee. And before we get into the conversation with Dr. Lee, we just want to welcome you to the Unlearn Show, where we undefine, unlimit, rethink, and unlearn. We unlearn our processes, our mental models, our ideas. We investigate our principles that we thought were the standard. We, we seek to rethink the norm extend the boundaries and redefine the standards thanks for joining us and thanks for being with us i hope you'll enjoy the conversation today with fritz and marcus marcus fritz how are you doing i'm good, I'm good. I'm good. Thank, thank you for 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 inviting me on here uh, just just the topic the unlearned show just just the name you had me with that jamie you you know probably going more than 10 years ago, one of my guiding philosophies in life to define is to limit. And it just mm. goes, goes well with this, being undefined, unlearning. So thank you for this invitation to be on here. Yes. Yes, we're certainly happy to, to have you here. Um, I, I know you're an excellent thinker and um, we hope to have a riveting conversation. Um, but I'll be doing most of the questioning. Um, I'm not so sure I have a lot to contribute here. I'm sort of out of my league here. I hope that you guys will be be open, be vulnerable, and just let it all fly. Marcus, tell us about how your life has changed since you left med school until where you are now. Um, tell us a little bit about that um, and that process for you J- jamie it has been just a very interesting journey um the story would have started before before medical school though so if if, if i may backtrack a bit i i was always um keyed in on on doing medicine having completed sixth form i remember applying for medical school and that was the only thing i didn't have a second choice or anything else and i got a, a deferred uh, time to go into medical school and persons would have said, why not try something else? Do, do pharmacy or, or pure applied. And it was no, just medicine. Went into med school, fast forward, you know, you know that story. Went, went through medical school, completed medical school, uh, did my medical internship and was on the trajectory, always wanting to do surgery to specialize. Was successful in starting that, that, that journey. And somewhere along the line, it was a wake up for me. I was like, for the rest of my life, is, is, this, is this the journey? I stepped away rather abruptly, and I think to the surprise of, of everybody, um, my family, my wife, the persons in the field, everybody would have been surprised by that abrupt, mm-hmm. like, I remember how it, how it was. I was going to work in the morning, and yeah, it was sudden. Within half an hour, that, there, there, was that, there was that change. 
Yes, I mean, you've always been an overachiever. Um, you've always been, um, you know, top of the class, graduating with excellence, even in med school, competing against other young adults from the Car from other Caribbean countries. You were you were you were always up there in terms of um, how you compared to your peers. How has it been dealing with those high expectations? Um, and, and how have you, um, how has that changed how you think about yourself and, and your life? Well, the truth is, though, Jamie, I, even with high expectations, I was always my, my own benchmark. So it was never about competing with anybody else. It was just always me focusing on, on, my, on my lane. I never was caught up in what anybody else was doing. I was just focused on what I want to, where, where I want to be. And I remember that, Jim, because we, we have come from a very, very far, um, mm. even, even during that time when you used to visit me at, when I was at UA, I remember this very distinctly, you, you saying to me that you, you'd want to see me push myself. So it's, it's, it's a bit, um, I want to know that you'd say I was always an overachiever because I remember that conversation, you said I'm an underachiever. And you'd want to see me really going out of my comfort zone. But and to, who, to, to whom much is given, much is expected, right? <laughs> yeah, so true. So, so, so I mean, that, that was kind of my thought process when I, when I said that, I remember so it was, um, it was, saying that. It was interesting, no, Jim. But um, for, for me, and, it's, and this is something that I've always relished, I, I love pressure. And I, th I think I, mm. I do best under pressure. The greater the pressure is, uh, for me, that, that's, that's what pushes, pushes me. And, and I think there's a, a distinction between stress and pressure. And, and, and that's where I, I think I... Uh, double, double click on that. Double click on that for, for us. The, the distinction that, that you have between um, stress and pressure. How do you think about that? All right. I, and, I, mm. and I'm pulling things from, from all over. So there was this concept I learned somewhere along the line in, in physics. And I didn't do much physics. Um, there, there was a formula, Young's modulus, it was called, and it was referring to the tension in which a uh, metal or, or spring could hold. And one, one of the formulas that, that was uh, used in that is stress over strain, and it incorporated pressure. So from then, I realized that there was a difference between pressure and stress. So for, for some reason, how, how I think, I always try to relate things that even probably other people wouldn't see. I would always try to, to bring across the different areas in my life to how it can be applied. So I, I thought that hey, there's, there must be a difference between stress and, and pressure if one is a part of the formula for the next. And, and that's how I, I initially started to look at it. And then going, going through um, with ex exposure, experience of different things, I, I would think that pressure is that... If, if you know the, and again, this is applying something else, there, there's this, it's almost like a, a bell curve um, with stress and performance. So the higher the, mm. the stress is, then the greater the performance is up to a point. But I don't think it is really the stress. I think it is the pressure and the external factors that, that are there to push persons and beyond that, beyond that a certain point then is where you have burnout and, and having all sorts of things going here where so I, I always try to see how, how I can push that boundary, how I can be under more pressure and see how, how much uh, more I could achieve with that. So I was always pushing the limits, seeing how much I could achieve in, in shorter space of time. That, that, that's interesting. That's interesting. And, I, and I'll turn to, to, to Fritz on this. Um, coming in new CEO, exec executive, I'm, I'm sure that you are under a lot of pressure. Um, and that pressure may lead to stress. Right? Um, how do you think about um, and balance that? W what sort of process do you have in place to, to ensure that you are in control of your, the way you think and not sort of led by what's happening or the expectations from outside? Yes, very good, very good. And it's interesting, Marcus. I don't want to stray off this. I want to go back to you to listen to what you're saying. I find it very interesting. But just to say for me, um, 
my thought process does not begin with my environment because it, then you start in a defined zone i go beyond the environment that put it this way i see the pressure is important because the external things while stress is how you internalize it and you know your pressure must always be greater than your stress <laughs> i'm not sure it's a new formula mark because i leave that to you to <laughs> interpret but it's just an interesting thing that's came up in my mind <laughs> but um yeah and pressure is important as you said and life is about balancing we have to balance but how can we in situations that seem impossible how can you find the new opportunities within those because opportunities exist within chaos it exists within that moment of change transition so mm -hmm. lots of opportunities lie in transition when people tend to back off that's the time when to it reminds me of the difference between the eagle and the and the other birds so the birds would run in a high you know with high wind current right but the the eagle uses the wind current to glide so that's essentially but Jamie, I want to turn it back over to Marcus. Let's hear him. <laughs> it's interesting. Yes. No, I, I think I think you know. I, I mean, we're 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 just applying different perspective. Um, I, I think it's it's good to hear um, different ideas um, between pressure and stress and, and and how we use that that process. I, I'm I'm keen though, Marcus, on on another process of yours that I'm I'm quite familiar with, and I know you use it a, a lot, which is this, you, you, your SWAT. Um, it's very widely used, very common process within organization. Um, but how do you use that to sort of guide or act as a mental model for you on, on a daily basis, almost? And, and that's a good question, Jimmy. I'm, I'm in a unique environment now where I, I practice medicine in, in the military context. And both uh, contexts, they, they will ind independently use different models. Uh, medicine is heavily evidence-based. Uh, you have different models used using military. For, for me, in any decision-making process, uh, situational awareness has has to be high, high there, uh, projecting into the future. But, but what's also important is, as best as possible, I, I always try to be objective, using, uh, and, th and this is something that I use a lot, uh, weighing different options that are available, putting a, almost a numerical value to the different options and seeing which one for this situation is best. Uh, this is what looking at the strengths and weaknesses of, of the different options um, presented in front of me and going beyond the SWOT, but also uh, using what we call the TOWS matrix, uh, seeing how we can leverage the, the weaknesses with the opportunities and threats with the the, um, the strengths. See how we can peer them, match them, and ultimately, which one will weigh out better when I put them in that scale. You know, I, I mean, uh, just to just to say that a, a lot of people, I mean, even, even in school, when we are writing an essay, we are oftentimes asked to give com com comparisons, to compare or to contrast um, two different you know, um, aspects of, or, or, or things just, let's say, let's call it that. And we sometimes create a, a list of things that are different and we create comparisons and we list them. But what, what, we, what happens is we, we tend to overweigh heavily a small, a small portion of those because we don't, or we are not objectively applying numerical value to those to that list when we make a comparison and i think it's a super important point when you're making a decision to sort of understand that these are the pros and these are the cons and each of them have numerical weighting that is therefore summarized and applied to get the to the final decision instead of just oh this have four cons this have three pros therefore the con outweigh the pros no. If one of the cons is the business will crash and die, if let's say you're evaluating a business and, and making a particular decision, then that has to be weighed more than just the upturn on the pro. If you if if I if I if you're understanding um what I'm saying. But but I'm curious, um Fritz, how how do you 
um, make these sort of decisions on a daily basis? What's your most important mental model when you're, um, when you're thinking? Well, and I'd like to say I, I am one of those people I, I don't like the SWAT because it starts, you try to find a solution within the very problem that you start with. You look for the strengths and the weaknesses, which are the internal parts. And then the opportunities and the threat is a way for me to retreat. I like the blue ocean shift model of the ERRC grid, where I start by thinking of creating. Because whenever you're forced to create something and eliminate something, it brings in a dimension of shift. It brings in a dimension that allows you to pivot. And this was for me. I, I mean, it works for others. But I remember I shared this little statement that came across recently. The uncreative mind can spot the wrong answers. But the creative mind can spot the wrong questions. Mm -hmm. So the mental model take you back to your realm of questions that you ask. And in the blue ocean shift, instead of the strengths and the weaknesses, which are the internal, because you tend to start in a domain where the boundaries are given. But the first two equivalent for the blue ocean shift, it is the eliminate and reduce. There are some things, if you really shift your mind, that you're offering the customers, you can eliminate it completely. They, they don't want it. You're, 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 you're bringing value in an area that's not needed. And you can reduce some things, but the most important part is on the opportunity. There are some things that you can raise and you're forced to create some things. Until you start creating something new, you start to change the environment that you're in. And let me just see if I can find a quick example in my mind. Let me see. There was a, a toilet paper company, a Brazil Brazilian company. If you remember this example, right. I was using the blue ocean shift. Yeah. And I use I use Brazil, Jimmy, because I can't see you. <laughs> All right. Um, right. They said they're gonna try to create a blue ocean shift with toilet paper. What can you do with toilet paper? Basically, change the color. Change the color. You can. But what they did, they observed in Brazil in the rural parts that. When the ladies went to shop, they'll carry two or three children with them. Then they have to take the public transport. The toilet paper was bulky, hard to carry. The apartments they live in were small. So first of all, they had challenge carrying. So what they did, they did a compactor mod model. They compact, they pressed the toilet paper and it became flat. So you, right. you take up 20% less space. And you'd be surprised to see how much of a difference that made. And when you when you open the packet, the roll pops back out and it forms the usual shape. So that twenty percent space allow them to increase profits by over eighty percent. So many times the change that we're looking for in a situation, we're looking for drastic changes, where sometimes a small change can shift things around. Just a small change can make things different. So I'd say in a situation that we can over compensate we can over what you call produce value that's not needed when you look at a remote control today uh, between a lg and a panasonic or a lg and a samsung you, you can see the buttons are getting more and more and the basic customers are so confused they just want three simple buttons but if you could save many of those keep you could reduce the keypad and increase the functionality that are needed so there are some things that you could eliminate that's not adding value to the customer so I just put in that sense, Marcos, to steer your mind a bit. <laughs> Let me leave it. Right. I mean, we're, we're going there. We're going there. Let's double click on that now. Um, as we are, we are on the blue ocean um, strategy, the blue ocean shift. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure Marcos has read the book as well. So how do you think about what to eliminate? First of all, we, 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 some things we can reduce that we can always look at. How do you think about what to eliminate? Because where am I going? It, it then shifts from, from only um, an, a, a something tangible to, to then a psychological thing. Yes, yes. Yeah. How do you think about that? And I would like to hear both of you answers on that. All right, well, the first thing since I started it, Marcos, yeah, you want to go? I yield here. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to talk no, no, so go, 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 and, and go, go. please, please go ahead. <laughs> all right, uh, let me just use a simple example. And first of all, you go in a space. It's good when you don't have any ties to that space. For example, let's let me use uh, for my 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 my, my sojourn in, in higher education. First thing I I said, okay, 
I look, I say, what's the purpose of a university? People tell you to give a degree to do this, but the purpose has a lot to do with the needs of your consumers. The first thing I said, okay, most of these consumers want a better life. They want a better job. And here we are telling people that you just need to stick to your books, get a degree, and you're fine. But when you get a degree and that degree has no value, I think I'd have cheated you. So I said, okay, you can ask the question from the wrong angle. Because people have so much confidence in an education system that is really outdated. Because the current education system we have was designed for the first industrial revolution. You need to produce people for the production line. So you started to, as was mass production. You move them in batches. You go to school, you ring the bell, you take people to break, you take them to this, and you find a credit system that can just move them up in batches. But it's different, Marcus, from your era of study, and that also from Captain Jamie. Captain Jamie had to do, he had to be competent to go to sea. It's not just about passing an exam. He had to prove that he was competent. You have to prove that you're competent to be a doctor, to be a surgeon. But here is it. I met a young man who came for an interview a few years ago, and he said, I said to him, what can you do? He said, I have a degree in general management. I said, what can you do? I'm a general manager. I said, no. You have a degree by the label of general manager, but you're nowhere near a general manager because you're not competent to become a general manager. You don't have the skills. So what you're lacking is an education system that was putting people forward without the necessary skills. So now flip the script. I said, okay, let's re invert where you start. You're starting from people asking what they want to do. Why not turn the questions around since most people are using the university and the college system to end up with a job. Why not go to the employers and ask them what is it that they want and start the education process from inside the industry as Jamie said, the inversion principle. He'll tell us more about that. That's one of his favorite. You invert the thing and then you work backwards. So that makes a difference. So there's, when you do this and you, you, your thought process goes outside of the so-called box or the circle, you're not able to see things that you can eliminate. Start with the assumptions. Start with the limitations. And that's where you're going to find things that you can eliminate. I'll turn it over to you. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so my, my mm, thought process... Go ahead, Marcus. My thought process and... And even in thinking of it, we're probably along a similar similar line. But my thought yeah. process is would be process mapping whatever the thing is, Jamie. Whatever we're, look, we're looking at, do a process map, see what the different areas involved in that that um, entity is, what areas involved in doing whatever this operation is, and seeing where this, the the pain points are, what mm -hmm. really isn't contributing much or what is contributing but very minimally and those are the areas that i would i would seek to eliminate i think in in my in my mind what is, is similar is looking at the end point working back seeing how do we get from the start point to that end point what factors are along the way of that journey and what really doesn't contribute much if anything and those are the things that I'd, I'd seek to eliminate. Excellent. Well, I mean, I, I, just to, I mean, you guys make such wonderful points. I mean, I, I'm, I'm excited to see how, how long we can keep this conversation going. When I, when I think about it, I remember I had a friend, an, an, an old friend of mine, um, you know, act somewhat of a mentor to me. Um, and I remember he told me one thing. I, I was, as a young man growing up, he said, if you're giving a gift or you're giving some value and it doesn't come as an inconvenience to you, then it's only a disposal. No, where am I going? I mean, I'm not sure if you remember, but, <laughs> but I mean, I, I, where, where am I going with this? Most times, the things that we need to dispose of is what appear in that very moment where we are having this discussion as one of the most value, valuable. Why? Because until you eliminate, the Im el elimination process is mainly to eliminate your current mindset, not to eliminate an action or a process. It's to eliminate the way of thinking. Until you can put an X through that, what is considered or held dearly, something along that line, then 
you will be able to move to the creation aspect, right? So, in fact, what you're doing is not only removing something. What you're doing is making room for creation. So if you see that, if you reframe elimination, not as elimination, but as fabricating the mindset for creation. If, if, you, see what I'm go, if you see what I'm going, that's where to start. What is valuable and held dearly? Let's get rid of that because what we're doing is not only removing, we are making space for creation, which is where the value is, or probably most of the value. Wow, Jimmy, that's prof profound you say that because it goes back to two processes that seem so similar, but they're different. One is burial and the other is planting. You and I have spoken about this already, Jamie. Yes. If you take something to bury it and to plant a seed and to bury a seed, it's a similar process. You have to dig the earth, you put the seed in and you cover it. Its darkness is cut off. But the difference with burial and planting is that burial is final. But planting have to go through the process of dying and the new life spring forth. So until you can kill that mindset that you have, you can't use the old frame that the Bible says, don't put new wine in old wine skin. It's going to break. Mm. I cannot take that thought process. So our thought process have to go through a change. Where sometimes let go of the process, allow it to shift, and you have to create a new process. So the burial, you have to bury that mindset. Allow it, and the Bible said, unless a corn of wheat falls into the ground and die, it abides right, alone. Right. Mm. But when it die, after it's dead, the new life spring forth. So new life and the old burial, they are two separate processes. And we have to allow our thinking to go through those separate processes. One to die completely for the other to emerge. Well, I, I, I would like that. And shifting perspectives is, is pretty much um, my summary of that. How, how then can we cause a shift in, in perspective of, of people in general? To look at these very similar processes or similar input, but the out, output, outcome, impact is totally different. So how, mm -hmm. how then can we change how we look at it? Uh, very good point. But if you... And let me just throw in another analogy just spring in my mind. Um, I was reading about two years ago. They found an Egyptian mummy. And inside the... The, you know, the whole embalmment and everything was some seeds. They tested them over 4,000 years old. And then they put the seed in the ground and plant them and they grow. Because the condition of burial is not conducive for growth. Until you can take those seeds and change the environment where you put them in the soil, where they can get some sunlight, they can get some moisture, then the growth process begins. Because the old mindset in which you bury something, it could not go anymore. It's the old wine skin that, that mm. reaches limits, mm. stretches limit. Until you can take, so the problem is not with the seed, it's with the environment. As Jamie said, the problem is with the mindset, not the skill set. All right. So I, I think there's something we can unlearn. Yes. There's a clear distinction between burial and planting. Mm -hmm. And that's what's happened. That's what happened with the seeds. Those seeds were buried they were not planted. And I think if we had time, we could dive into the differences <laughs> and the nuance. So a lot of the times when we are thinking about our business or we're thinking about our lives or we're thinking about our relationships, what's happening is you are being misled to think that you are planted because it's dark mm. and it's cold. But in truth and in fact, what's happening is that you're buried, not planted. <laughs> um, you don't really plant the dead, right? You bury the dead. Um, but you plant a seed. Let let let's move along. Let let's move along. We're here. Um, <laughs> interesting ideas. No, I would like to talk about one. Of, um, I'm a new father. Yes. Um, Fritz, your 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 parent, Marcus. What says you? Parent to be in the to be. Yes. Parent to yes, be. Yes. Um, let's talk about parenting a little bit. Now, Fritz, three main points. I, I just put up two fingers, if you realize, and, and asked three. <laughs> three main points <laughs> that you have used, three, three, three models, three ideas that you have used 
to guide you through your parenting process. Hmm. Very interesting. And at first, I'd like to say that all the points that I started with, they're not out the window. I have no points. <laughs> <laughs> because parenting is a job that comes without a manual. <laughs> what, I, what I have at the end oh, are, wow. are lessons. <laughs> and uh, it sounds crazy, Marcus, right? But <laughs> yeah, no, what no, I have no. at the end are lessons. Huh? No, I'm listening because this is no, I just took up my little <laughs> notepad to, to start making some notes as well. Yeah. Jamie, all the points I started, these are it. They are not. The only, mm. I want to tell you, the best parenting book is the Bible. Right. You can, just again, you can plant seeds, but you're going to find you have two children. Jamie, you're now into your second child. They're light and they're night and day. They're totally opposite. Right. At times you'd like to use and say, okay, let me fix the children, adjust the children. You're going to find the taste, the thinking, everything is totally different. This tell me how diverse creation is. And it's going to pull on you to deal with each person because they're two separate personalities, two separate individuals. And what I found, the lessons looking back, the most important thing, or the most important things, first of all, is the time you invest in the Word of God. I'm just telling you. No matter, it's not about the things you do, you go to places, you do things, you try to bring across life lessons. But learning takes place at different points in different seasons. And you have seasons in life. And when you reach the teenage years, you're going to find that, hey, the less you say is the more you say. What I've learned as time goes by is to say less. <laughs> the less I say is the more I say. Sometimes because they watch your life and they're saying, Hush, you know, your actions speak louder than your words. I don't know how I'm sounding, but I'm just saying it is a job that you cannot do. <laughs> I have to depend <laughs> on God to do it for me. <laughs> Let me put it there. <laughs> Marcus, I've totally, you say what kind of crazy people you're on with, right? No, no, I, right. These, these are things that I, I, I always heard that I was crazy, and these are the things that, that are very interesting for me. The, <laughs> the opinions yeah, that would probably have... different. We, we should probably have named the podcast the Mad People Podcast. Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I would have done that from before you sent me the link. I'd be on. <laughs> no, I, let, let me tell you one principle that 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 I use, and and I would certainly agree. Um, I would first let me say that the principles that apply to my life, I'm sure, probably will not apply to my kids. Right. Let me start there, but. I mean, the Bible says, train up a child in the way he should grow. When he's old, he's never, or she's old, she'll never depart from it. You, you tend to find that it is those biblical concepts, at least from my perspective, that act as a moral compass um, and guide that I use as reference from, from, my, from what my parents imparted on me. But... One principle that I, I, I find very valuable and that change is the only constant. Mm. That's certainly one principle that I have used in the brief stint that I've had uh, being a parent. Change is the only constant and there's absolutely no substitute for time. There is absolutely no currency you can substitute for time. Mm -hmm. Name a currency as valuable as time. And sometimes we try to use other means, of other currency for, um, to substitute time. There is no currency you can use to substitute time. No, this is important. There is time and there is quality time. Mm -hmm. Distinguish between the two from very early. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have nothing further to add. Marcos, over to you. <laughs> no, I, and, you know, as, as a parent-to-be, I always would, would think of when that time comes, what would I want to 
impart on that boy or girl, that child. And I would always look back at my childhood, what I, I valued and what I treasured, what were the, the learning points for me. But I threw all of that through the door recently. When I, I was reading somewhere, I don't, I don't remember where, where now. And, and it was very, very true. I was being prepared for a different world. So what, what was good for me then, well, mm. it, won't, it won't necessarily be, be good for my, for my child, no. No, no, that's different from, from the concepts that are, that are presented in the Bible. That will always stay true regardless of the change in the time. But the reality is the world is changing. What, what we grew up on Jimmy in the, in the country 20, 30 years ago, that is different from what the reality our children w- will face. Is a different world and it's something that, that, that I've always questioned. What will, will the world be in, in 10, 15 years' time with all the changes and everything? So it, it, for me, I, know, I don't know what the answer is, but I know that what I grew up on won't necessarily be, be what will be good for my children when that time comes. Wow, very good. And very good, Marcus. That's very interesting. All, very, very everything good. that we learn about ourselves is, no, is not going to be relevant to the, our children. As you rightly said, Jamie, you mentioned time and quality time. That's so powerful. Because that quality time is the only investment that you can leave. The only investment is not the quantity, mm. but the quality. And it takes me back to searching the Bible. And I know it's a principle from God himself, Jesus, is that there are two things he does when he announces the birth of a child. The name and the purpose. His name shall be called Jesus because he shall be the savior mm-hmm. of the world. His name shall be called John because he shall pave the way for the Messiah. Right. So, what is this saying to me? In parenting, we need to find first and foremost, seek God. Not just how nice the name sound, but your name and your purpose are tied together. So our job as parent is to help that child find their purpose. And your purpose has to do, Jamie and I shared this some time ago. There's a verse in Ecclesiastes. I love that book. It's written by Solomon, the wisest man. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, I think it's verse 11. <coughs> and it says that, you know, God have hidden a piece of eternity in the heart of the human right. spirit. So there's something inside of us that drives us beyond that we cannot sleep, allows us to stay awake at night. And that's our purpose. And a child, we have to help them to find their purpose. That's their connected point. That's their piece of the jigsaw puzzle in in life. So that's our role to be that coach, that mentor for them for the period to help them to find their true purpose. Because every individual has a purpose and it's different. And there are some purpose that won't come. Marcus, I turned over to you. I see you you're thinking, <laughs> go ahead. Yes. No, I, I wouldn't want to cut it because I'm, I'm really no, no, fascinated go ahead. by this. It's, this. This is something that I, I've been working on uh, in recent times. And I, as you say it, the word purpose, it, it's struck with me because that is what I've been working on, a model of passion and purpose and how, how those uh, two interact. And one of the things I found, and I've been questioning, even for myself, what is my passion, my purpose? And, and I'm, I was wondering, the interaction of those two, and if a lot of person, a lot of people in the world, if they have discovered their purpose, and how they, that purpose is interacting with, if there's any passion. And I just started reading um, Grit by um, Paula, I have it right here, no, Angela Duckworth today. I just, I just took yeah. it up. I had it on my shelf for, for, for some time. And I see where a big part of, of the, the few pages that I've read just thus far is about passion. And I, I'm just looking now how that will tie into what I've been thinking of in the, in the past few months, the interaction between passion and purpose. But I, I love how you have put it, that parenting, uh, one, of, one of the things, or the important thing is to help that child to find your purpose. And I'm wondering if that is a missing factor in a lot of people in the world today, not knowing their purpose. Yes, yes. That, 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 is, that is so important because that's it, you know, the purpose, when you find your purpose, you never work another day in your life. 
I mean, but but isn't it that most people don't know their purpose? I mean, uh, how can I help my child to find their purpose if I myself don't know my know my purpose? Um, it, it, it's it's a big question, right? I, I think um, one other principle that I think about is that the map is not the territory, and it is parenting is as much of a journey for the parent as it is for the child. Yes. It is it is it it is equally or probably more um, of of a learning experience and a process for the parent as it is for the child. Yes, and I and I think the it, it your mindset going into the whole thing um, ought to be very flexible because going into parenting is to going in understanding that. I do not know much about this thing. Or and it's a journey, and it, <laughs> or nothing, and, and it's a journey. It's a process, and I'm going to have to continuously learn, develop, work, unlearn, and, and, and try it, and, and unlearn. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Um, it's 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 an interesting um um I'm I'm, I'm thought. And um, I would like to, to, to ask, though, about um, changing careers. And it, I mean, I, I know we're, we're kind of jumping through the different topics, but it's a lot to talk about. We, we don't have all the time in the world. And I would love to get these ideas from, the mind, from your minds. I mean, how do you think about changing careers, Marcus? Uh, have you ever, I mean, how, how, when you made a transition from surgery, something that almost all the doctors who come to universities, come to the university, want to do, and you decided, I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm going to join the army. How do you think about that? How do you make that decision? Well, Jim, man, I, I, I tell people that that decision was, was me jumping off the cliff, not knowing what is down below but being confident that I will find my way down. Whether it is to swim if it is water or to fly if it is rocks. That, that's how I look at it when I, when I, when I, when I made that jump. Um, I really don't like the, the status quo. And, and growing up, I would always be even the weirdest person because I'm just going to be doing something different. Ironically, I, I would say, that, that change in career for me, I knew one of, one of my challenges was discipline. And I said, mm. let, let's see if the arm which is built on discipline is, is something that, that would help me to work on that. And I've come into this field, I've, I've grown, and it's, it's a constant growth for me, which, which, which is very, very good for me. I, I'm addicted to growing, I'm addicted to the challenges and facing those challenges. Having come to look for, for, for discipline, I've now gone beyond discipline. Discipline has now been thrown out the door. It's more so now consistency. And it's always looking for, for, for something else on, on that growth trajectory. What, what is it, the challenge for me? And we, we speak of this all, all the time, Jane, and, and we've, there are so many words in this discussion that have been, been thrown out. I, I'm a guy of words. Each year I'll, I'll come up with a word and say, this is, this is my word. And I, I heard one earlier and I, I smiled when uh, Fritz said, said pivot. Um, I, I went beyond, beyond um, discipline. I'm now looking at what, what is next. And, and in that growth trajectory for me, working on that consistency and dedication, that's, that's where I, I see myself. So it's not more. It's not about the career for me. More so the personal development and the, my personal development. I see will contribute to the to, to my growth in whatever career. Right. So so if if I'm understanding um, I'm correctly, right? Mm -hmm. You realized that you had a deficiency, if you want to call it that, or a fear, or something that you want to work on, right. which is discipline, right. and you. And you change your life to position yourself and steer your ship. You altered course and steered your ship 
a pivot, right? Um, and steered your ship directly into that path that would work on or you thought that would develop something that you were most efficient in. It, 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 it doesn't make sense, right? It's counterintuitive because it's not playing into your strength. You think that you'll want to go, which is the typical um, education um, system. They, you're taught to move in the direction that you are strongest. Yeah, I I, I, is... I went totally against that. I, I went against the grain, Jamie. I my, my brain is probably wired wired wrong, but I, I love the challenges. So it wasn't for me to go along the the path of least resistance or the easy path. It is to to find that difficult path. I I was never anything physical. I I don't know anything about military army getting up and running and all these things. That that was never me. But it was something that I saw would would be something that would be working on some of those deficiencies for me and it, i have learned a lot i've grown i've seen how even outside of um the practice of medicine which is what i, I do primarily but growth in other areas of life has, has been, been tremendous and i, 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 I still i still look learn. forward to the, the other challenges that are to come it, it's really a process to unlearn wow. um wow. Yeah, I, I think facing those fears, when you're thinking about careers and changing your career, when is the time to make the decision? How do you make the decision? Right? And if you, if you see yourself as a complete vessel, maybe it's time to face those fears. Maybe it's time to go not where the ocean is red and where your strengths probably lie, but to, to look out to use the standard as a starting point this is where i'm strong and, and and this is where i add most value however i am competing against myself here and i want to make a change let me run where i am weakest yeah, man. out in the blue way out in the deep don't ever out in the blue interesting we're going out here fritz how do you think about that very interested as you're just listening to you both. That is very good because your weaknesses leads you to your vulnerability. Greatest vulnerabilities are found in your weaknesses. When you're vulnerable, you're most adaptable to change. And that's when our true purpose can come alive. Not in our strengths, because in our strengths, we think we know it all. Yeah. And we make the decisions. And I just use another little example with Moses. Here was Moses going to Pharaoh's university. He was being trained to become the next Pharaoh. He knew all there was about leadership. And then he had to retreat in a wilderness. In the backside of a desert. Where it took God 40 years to help him to unlearn. <laughs> mm. So our greatest challenge is not learning, is unlearning. Indeed. Indeed. Uh, I mean, that, that's such an interesting um, idea. Um, and, and, and the Moses reference is, is wonderful, right? You know, um, it, it, should have, it should have been a 40-day journey. <laughs> but that unlearning process, um, <laughs> God um, wanted the, the, the Moses and the children of Israel to go through. Took them 40 years. Took them 430 years. Yeah, indeed. Words. Yes. Um, so, I mean, it is that unlearning yes. is probably more difficult than learning. And it is because what, it, what we have that we can see and hold on to is our comfort zone. And to throw that out when it goes against the, the old saying, don't throw it out if it's not broken. Something is working, mm. but you're prepared to throw it out and take the risk of looking for something better. And it's a concept of giving. Because until we release what is in our hands before we can get new things to come into our hands. As long as we hold on to what we have, we cannot get more in our hands until we empty our hands. Very interesting. Don't throw it out unless it's broken. Maybe we need to unlearn that concept. Yes. <laughs> Maybe we need to unlearn that yes. concept. Yeah. I mean, in some areas and some disciplines, it's applicable. Yes. But it is not and should not be broadly 
use. Don't throw it out if it's not broken. Yes. I think, like you rightfully said, no. There are some things that we, we, we need to throw out because that's where we are going to create and, and multiply significantly more because we have changed that mindset yes. and, and thrown out something that is um, the value. And, and, and human, it's, it's human nature as well, right? Yeah. We react. We react best when our backs are against the wall. Yes. When, when we are at rock, bot, rock bottom, yes. that's when we are most likely to create because that's when we, our, the instinct take over of just creating and moving and managing and surviving until you put it, you remove something or your environment or space where you're most comfortable. Open up yourself to vulnerability. That's where we can make the most impact. And Jamie, I had an interesting conversation today with an eight-year-old child. <laughs> Mm. And I was just trying to look in his world. And he was describing his last Taekwondo competition. And he said he was fighting against this young man who was much stronger. And what happened? He said the young man had a very strong kick. He did not know how to kick very well. So every time the young man kicked and came in with his kicks, he would back up, back up till he realized he was at the edge of the box. One more step and he'd be out. Mm. So he waited till the young man kicked and then he rushed in and started to throw punches. And that's what he was doing. Just throwing the punches. He waited for that opportunity and I said, wow, what a lesson I've learned from this young man today. And he won the fight. Mm. Interesting. <laughs> Very interesting. Yeah. That's the lesson from my eight-year-old. Yeah. No, that, that, that's the leadership we need. That's the leadership we need. <laughs> <laughs> Being led by the child, right? Yes. Um, I mean, wonderful, wonderful lesson. The patience that's coming out, but also seizing the opportunity and throwing the punches. Yes. I, I think also, it, it's also an important point to understand that, you know, the box, the idea of the box. Yes. While you are within the box, you're going to be throwing punches. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> until, so that, that also must be said. Uh, until on uh, while you remain in the box, yes. You will need to throw punches. Yes. Let's start by moving outside of that box. Yes. And setting sail for the blue ocean. So we don't really need to throw punches. So, <laughs> Awful. right. So, so, I mean, it, it's a wonderful lesson from that eight year old. Very interesting. Final point and final question, final topic, final idea that we'd like to discuss is how do you know? Uh, this is the first part of the question where you are in life. What do I mean? If I'm looking at myself and I'm evaluating my position in the cycle, in, my, in the life cycle, not my age, not my financial status, not my educational achievements, but in terms of my development, how do I make that evaluation? Mm. Very deep point, Jamie. And my mind goes back to Apostle Paul in the Bible. Mm. And there's an interesting story. I think it's in Acts chapter 27. That story is the most defined story about shipwreck that we ever have. It was when Paul was heading to Rome. He was going to Rome because he was a Roman citizen and the Jews wanted to kill him. The, the religious leaders wanted to kill him, the Pharisees. And he appealed to Caesar as a Roman citizen because he was a dual citizen. He was a Jewish citizen as well as a Roman citizen. As a Roman citizen, he appealed to Caesar. So he was on the ship to go to Rome. And for two weeks, they were caught up in a storm. They did not... Yes. Uh, uh, you want to just repeat that question, Jamie? Let me just... Continue. I, I, let, me, let me apologize. I, I, I've been coming off for like five minutes. I just got an emergency that I have to be organizing okay. some logistics for. But I, okay, I, we understand. That, 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 that's fine. That's fine. We're going to wrap up this section soon. Just say quickly, yes. Jamie, ask again. Just quickly, Jamie, repeat the question. Um... 
The question is, how do you evaluate your life position, where you are in life? Not your financial position, not your educational achievements, not your um, age. How do you evaluate where you are in life? And Jamie, one of the things I've learned is when you look, the only thing you can take with life, take away from life, is what was done for Christ. Everything else will disappear. Money, achievements, everything, all those will go. And I'm led to the example from Apostle Paul. When in, in Acts chapter 27, there was a story when Paul was on his way to Rome to be tried by Caesar, right? And for two weeks, they had to, all, it says, when all hope was lost, that they, they, they were going to die. They had thrown everything off, the sea anchors, everything went off. There was no more hope. And he said that an angel visited Paul. And Paul was confident that he would not die. Why? Because part of his purpose was to preach in Rome. So until your purpose is completed, so your fulfillment comes with your purpose, which is bigger than you, not with your status or your achievements. Achievements are historical. Purpose is forward-looking. And he said, I know I will not die because I have to preach in Rome. So anytime we have completed our purpose, it's time for us to vacate the earth. I'll leave it there because the time is limited. Let's hear Marcus. <laughs> Marcus, let's let's hear your, your thought on your thoughts on No, I, I, I'm just fascinated by, by Francis' answer because again, an underlying theme I will come back to is, is purpose. We, we 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 came across purpose in looking at parenting, but also in looking yeah. at our own lives. So mm. I'm just tying the two together now because even in performing or, or parenting mode it, the reverse may also be true we're, we're to help them to find their purpose but they may also be helping us to find our purpose and to fulfill that so that that's just an mm, interesting good. thought that came, came to me but it, it is just mind blowing for me that it, it comes down to purpose and if, if this is what it our lives um, are centered around purpose how, how, how then can can persons identify their purpose is it a case where this is something that is learned discovered um something that they need to unlearn to find their purpose uh, this is this is just something that is not fascinating to me i really love this this word purpose can can be can be conflicting you know um if you think about it right you tend to love what you do the more you do something the more you love it so the question is then do you love it because you do it or do you do it because you love it? <laughs> no, it, it, it is a very interesting and fundamental <laughs> question at its core, right? <laughs> because if you, if, if you get up and, and that's where discipline comes in, Marcus, if you realize that if you start jogging every day, going to the gym and doing something repetitively and it becomes a part of you, you realize that you start liking it. Mm. Not, not all things, but some things. But the, the, then the question is, do you do it then because you like it or you love it or it's your purpose or it's your purpose because you do it? <laughs> How do you think about that? <laughs> yeah, and this, is, this is something about the Beatles because these, and these are philosophical questions that I really love, you know. Sometimes we, we just don't know the answers to these things. But it's just this thought-provoking, I'd say mind-blowing. Uh, we have to look into this now. Let, let me get direct then. Uh, Fritz, Fritz, what's your purpose? My purpose? My purpose is to empty myself in others. Mm. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. Marcos, what's your purpose? So I, I'm, I'm hoping to discover mine. Th mm. That is a journey that I'm on, Jamie. I, and, and the question was asked to you as something to discuss because... That is something that I, I think I'm at that, that juncture now. What, what is it really? I, I know it may be something that I probably don't have the answer to or it's just not defined. But it's, it's something that I'm, I'm working towards um, finding. And it's bigger than you. I, 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 let me tell you this. <laughs> um, I, I, and, I, and, and, and again, Let's hear it, Jamie. the unlearned show is a, is a <laughs> vulnerable space, right? It's, and it's a safe space. I believe that my purpose is preaching. Mm -hmm. No, that's that's my belief. Right? No. The question is, if you know your purpose, why aren't you fulfilling that purpose? 
and, and this is something that I've struggled with and I've had a number of discussions on I've read on it and I've tried my best to, to sort of understand how to think about that process but how but I've grown to under, understand and been led to understand that achieving or fulfilling your, your, your purpose is not dictated or doesn't have to be immediate yeah. you're led by a process mm -hmm. and a preparation for fulfilling that purpose paul's shipwreck or paul being shipwrecked was an important part of his preparation for fulfilling his purpose which is the preaching yes so i think about it in, in this way as i still need a few shipwrecks mm. <laughs> Before I can get to Rome to do my preaching, <laughs> and Jamie, I think I think I think we're on the next week topic. <laughs> I think this yeah, we really right. need to I, pick I, up. I, up I, Marcus is so interested. We can let this go. No, I, Jamie, I, I, I think we have to pick up the next topic. For, for me, even though even though I, I I wouldn't say I I can pinpoint my purpose. No, what I know is that all of my experiences and exposure to this point have been preparing me. I think I've been growing, and probably. Is looking back, I would say that was my purpose. But I know I'm, I'm, I'm living forward to continue on this on this journey, and, that, and that's how I look at, at my life as a, as a journey and writing a, a, a story. Probably it is when I, I'm at the final paragraph, I would say, Oh, I can turn the purpose at that point as, as being this interesting, interesting way of thinking about your purpose, interesting way of thinking about your purpose. Um, let, let, let me put a pin in that though. Hindsight is, any, is, is anything but 2020. So again, looking forward, looking back, looking ahead. Let's incorporate the idea structures, the process of unlearning in our daily lives. We want to thank Dr. Lee, thank Fritz for being with us. And thank you for joining the Unlearn Show. I hope that you created a new memory. Join us next week as we seek to unlearn, to rethink, to undefine, and to create a new memory. We hope that you were inspired. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Thank you. I hope I get the next invitation because this was interesting. <laughs> next week. <laughs> next week. <laughs>